Welcome back, everybody. This is Earth and Space Science 102. I'm Stephanie Welch. And today we're going to leave our solar system and actually talk about all of the rest of the stars that are out there. The subject that we covered last time was our sun, and we wanted to talk about our sun mainly so that we would have a focal point for talking about all the rest of the stars out there in the night sky. Something that is really, really close to us that we can observe a little bit more intimately, and then apply what we know about our sun to all of the other stars that are out there. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, first, in this uh, first of three lectures concerning stars, we're going to classify stars. And we really, when it all sort of boils down, we classify them by comparing them to our own. We're going to find there are much brighter and hotter and more amazing stars out there that, than our own. The only reason that ours is at all special is because we happen to be right on top of it. Um, so we'll also find that some are dimmer and lower in temperature than our own, that our star just sort of falls uh, roughly in the middle of an overall spectrum. So if you take a look at this uh, first picture, it really gives you a decent taste, this, uh, kind of a, a, a decent start to understanding how different all of these stars can actually be. So when you take a look at this picture, you can see that some of these stars outshine other stars out there. Um, this is one of the, uh, the Hubble deep field pictures. You can see that some are dim and faint and probably more distant than others. Some are really, really bright and give off a tremendous amount of light. Um, some are colored red. Some are colored blue. Um, there are white stars out there. And so uh, particularly in a really crisp picture like this Hubble deep field picture, you can start to detect all of the nuanced differences between one star and the next. Now, when you start to actually take a look, compare one to the other, you need some way of being able to compare all of these things, especially with the understanding that some are a lot further away than others. The distances to even the closest stars are light years away from Earth, and the more distant stars that you're seeing here could be entire galaxies that are billions of light years away. So when we look at a, a picture like this, we have to begin to look for differences between all of those stars, and that's going to allow us to classify them. Things like the color are going to relate back to the surface temperature of the stars, and so too is going to be the, um, the spectral type of these stars, and something we'll, we'll talk about later. So that's just going to be one aspect of looking at the differences between these stars, their temperature. Another big difference, especially when you take out the effect of distance, is going to be the amount of light that they actually send out into the universe, their luminosity. It's a measure of the true brightness of the object. Those are probably the easiest two criteria, the easiest two variables to try to understand and to use to classify stars. But the thing that both of those variables are actually going to boil down to, and the single most important property of stars, is going to be the star's mass. A star's mass is going to influence both its luminosity and its temperature. But while this is the most important property of a star, it's the uh, most difficult to observe directly. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at all of these classification properties. We're going to start with luminosity, defining luminosity, looking at um, how that's different than the amount of light that actually reaches us. Then we'll go on to talk about temperature and how we determine the surface temperature of each one of these stars out there. And then we'll look at how both of those properties then relate back to mass. Now, to give us a basis for comparison, I wanted to throw some numbers at you. And the first thing to remember here is that I don't expect anybody to go through and memorize any of these properties. I don't even have most of these properties memorized. We can classify other stars by, again, comparing it back to our own. So I wanted to have uh, you know, some properties of our sun to compare back to. For instance, its radius, giving you an idea of its overall size. And the size of stars can vary, especially when you look at a star in various points during its own lifetime. Stars expand and contract, especially during the later stages of their life. 
So the radius is an important property. The mass is, again, probably the most important property, and that doesn't vary over time. The mass pretty much has to stay consistent. And then the mass is going to influence the last two properties, luminosity and temperature. So the only one of these that I'll admit to actually having memorized is that last one, the surface temperature of our sun at 5,830 Kelvin. Um, but you don't need to memorize that number. These are going to be the properties of our sun that we're going to compare other stars back to. Because again, our sun is just another star out there in the night sky. Now, the first property, probably one of the easiest to understand and the easiest to observe directly, is luminosity. Luminosity is sort of just a fancy way of saying the actual amount of light that an object produces. So this is a property that you could also attribute back to something like a light bulb. You could think of light bulbs and compare different wattages of light bulbs in terms of their luminosity, if you wanted to use a more grand term. It basically means the true amount of power, the true amount of light that that light bulb actually produces. Now imagine that you're standing in a field and you've got lots and lots of light bulbs going on all around you. They're all turned on and some are really close to you and some are a lot further away. Part of the amount of light that actually reaches you is going to be an aspect of the distance to each one of those light bulbs. So some of the most distant light bulbs might just appear to be more dim to you, not because they truly are more dim, but because that light is having to travel across a longer distance to get to you. So the apparent brightness of a star or a light bulb or anything else that you wanted to talk about that's producing light is the amount of light that actually reaches you. And in terms of stars, the apparent brightness of a star is the amount of starlight that actually reaches Earth. A star that's four light years away, like Proxima Centauri, is going to allow for a lot more of that light to actually reach us here than a similar uh, luminosity star that might be 40 light years away or 400 light years away. So the distance ends up being really, really important in determining how much light actually reaches us here. Another way of thinking about this is that, you know, imagine that the Earth's surface weren't a sphere, that there wasn't a horizon on the Earth's surface, and that you were able to look out into the distance and look out across the entire surface of the Earth. Imagine that the Earth was flat. Which city would appear brighter to you? Would it be New Orleans, if our vantage point was Hammond, or would it be New York City? Now, even though New York City is obviously the brighter of the two cities with more night lights, then e even considering that, New Orleans would appear brighter to us just because it's closer to us. Our sun has, you know, it's not even an arguable quantity, our sun definitely has the greatest apparent brightness of any object in the sky. And that's just, again, because we're parked right on top of it. It's this incredibly bright object already that we are very, very close to. The distances to any of the other stars out there are incomparable to the mere 150 million kilometers that we are to the sun. So that's the difference, again, between luminosity, the true measure of how much power and how much light a star produces, versus apparent brightness, or just brightness, if you will. So luminosity is the part that we actually want, that we actually need, if we're going to compare stars sort of apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. Comparing stars in terms of their apparent brightness doesn't really tell us much about a star's property, because again, you have to take distance out of the equation to be able to compare them properly. Now the relationship between apparent brightness and luminosity is going to depend on distance, but distance is something that's a little bit tricky to talk about when you're actually talking about the distance that light travels from an object like a star or a light bulb. Now, something like a light bulb or a star doesn't just produce light in one direction. It doesn't just produce, like, let's say, one ray of light that's traveling from the star to you. It's producing light in all directions. So we could think of the amount of power that the star is actually generating and the amount of light that it's actually generating in terms of the area of a sphere, with the distance being the radius of that sphere.
So the distance between us and our nearest uh, celestial neighbor, our nearest star, um, besides our sun, obviously, is Proxima Centauri. And that's around about four light years away. Now, you could think about Proxima Centauri as producing light that emanates out in all directions, and that distance is just part of the area of the sphere of the light that's traveling out in all directions. And the area of a sphere is 4 pi, which is a constant, 3.14, d squared, or r squared, if you will. So whether you're putting an R for radius or D for distance, it doesn't really matter. Um, but that number ends up being the distance between us and that star. If we were talking about this in terms of a light bulb and you were standing 10 feet away from a light bulb, you'd put in 10 feet for that distance. So now that we have a way of doing that, now that we know the relationship between luminosity and distance um, and apparent brightness and luminosity, we can come up with an equation to be able to not deal anymore with apparent brightness, which is the amount of starlight that we're actually collecting from one of these objects. And we can actually look at it in terms of luminosity if we know the distance to the star. So as it turns out, luminosity the true amount of light that's actually produced by a star is a function of its apparent brightness, the amount of light that actually reaches us, times this distance function of 4 pi d squared. So when you take the amount of light that actually reaches us, the apparent brightness, and this 4 pi d squared, might multiply them against each other, then distance kind of works its way out of that equation and you come up with a true amount of power that the star produces. You come up with the star's luminosity. Now, the trick to all of this is that you actually have to have distance. You have to have some, uh, you know, at least um, uh, somewhat uniform way of trying to come up with a distance between where Earth is in the universe and where that star that you're talking about is. And so that's going to be the next thing that we have to tackle, how we calculate stellar distances. Before I get there, I wanted to go back to this Hubble deep field picture in the visible light spectrum and give you an idea of the range of luminosities of stars in this picture and the rest of the stars out there in the night sky. Um, we've got these in scientific notation, but it's still pretty easy to understand. In uh, comparing the luminosities of these stars to the luminosity of our sun, they are 10 to the negative fourth of the luminosity of our sun. So that's 0 0.0001 uh, times the luminosity of our sun. So a mere tiny fraction of the luminosity of our sun to roughly 10,000 times the luminosity of our sun, 10 to the sixth. So that's an incredible range in brightness, and that puts our star, if not quite in the middle of that overall spectrum of luminosity, maybe a little bit even on the dim side. So if we're using the comparison again to light bulbs, and you're thinking about all of these light bulbs as emanating a different amount of wattage, a different amount of light, then that puts us sort of rather on the, 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 the dim side. Uh, there are far, far brighter stars out there, and there are also dimmer stars. Most of our closest celestial neighbors, stars like Proxima Centauri, are actually dimmer than our star. So at least in our little neighborhood um, within the Milky Way galaxy, we have a fairly bright star. Now, the next thing that we have to tackle is how you go about determining the distance to any one of these stars. If you remember back a few lectures back, I believe it was maybe lecture 11 or 12, the distance to the stars is the thing that really, really caused the Greeks to stumble when they were trying to figure out whether we lived in an Earth-centered system or a Sun-centered system. The Greeks' proof that the Earth was not in motion and that everything in the universe had to be moving around the Earth was the fact that if Earth were moving, we'd be able to detect something called stellar parallax. So stellar parallax is this idea that if Earth is truly in motion and orbit around the Sun, then this could sh should cause a subtle little shift in closer stars relative to stars that are further away. And you can see this by putting out one finger in front of you, closing one eye and opening the other, and then switching eyes. When you switch back and forth, it causes the object that's closer to you, your finger in this case, to shift around. 
And what's happening here is that it's just an apparent shift. The finger itself is not moving. It's an apparent shift caused by a shift in viewpoint. That's what parallax is all about. Now, if you still remember back to that lecture, you remember that the Greeks basically couldn't detect stellar parallax. Because they couldn't detect stellar parallax, they assumed that the Earth was stationary. As it turns out, the stars are way, way further away than they originally thought. For the analogy to work, I'd have to have my finger two miles away to have the same sort of comparison between the Greeks trying to detect the stellar parallax phenomena. You can actually detect it, it just requires more sophisticated technology than the Greeks had available. It requires the use of a telescope to be able to detect stellar parallax. Now the reason I remind you of all of this is because stellar parallax ends up being one way that we can actually come up with a distance to the stars. We can look, use a little bit of math and figure out a distance between Earth and some of at least the closer stars, the stars that actually do subtly shift with a shift in our position, a shift in our viewpoint as Earth orbits the Sun. So we determine some distances, distances to the closer stars, by stellar parallax. And in a picture like, again, this deep field picture, this Hubble deep field picture, those closer stars usually end up being the dimmer, redder stars in the picture. So pick out any red, uh, red star in this picture that you like, and think of that star as something that's going to actually shift in position just a little bit if we look at it at two very different times during the year. If we look at it in winter, versus summer while we're on different parts of the trek of our orbit. So if you look at that nearer star, whichever red star you picked out in that picture between, let's say, January and July, that star's position will appear to shift, but only against the background of these fixed distance stars. That shift, that subtle, tiny, microscopic shift that you can only detect with a telescope, gives us a way of calculating the distance, basically the dashed line in this picture, between Earth and that nearby star. You can, um, I'm, I'm not going to go into the math behind this because you don't need to uh, actually be able to calculate this distance for yourself, but you can use basically a little tiny bit of trigonometry given the distance between Earth and the Sun and the angle that the um, distance between the Earth and that nearby star and the, and the Earth and the Sun, the angle between those, you can use that to figure out the hypotenuse of your triangle, basically, that dashed line. So for our purposes, again, I don't want to get too far into this, you can use that subtle little shift, the stellar parallax that did actually occur, in order to calculate the distance between Earth and that nearby star. And by calculating that distance, that allows us a way of comparing apples to apples all of these different luminosities, because with that distance, we can take apparent brightness out of the equation and we can just focus on the true amount of light that the star produces. Now that only works for fairly close stars. The parallax thing with your finger again, kind of switching eyes and looking at that shift in the position of your finger, only works if you're actually concentrating on some fixed background. So you have to have a background of more distant stars for that to work, and so this only really works for stars that are relatively close to Earth, between maybe a one in 10, or I'm sorry, one in maybe a thousand light years uh, from Earth to that nearby star. There are stars that are millions or even billions of light years away that we can't use stellar parallax to detect those distances. So in those cases, we have other ways of trying to determine the distance between Earth and those really, really distant stars and really distant galaxies and even the far edge of the universe. Um, they just become increasingly more and more complex, but I wanted to at least sort of briefly kind of take you through some of these other techniques. So really, really close distances, distances within our own solar system, we can use radar to determine those distances. Distances to the nearby stars, we can use stellar parallax, and that's very reliable. Beyond the zone in which you can use stellar parallax, there are overlapping zones where you can use other techniques. And I'm just going to focus on a couple of these. 
Uh, let's start with this idea of a distance standard, how we determine distances to the most distant objects out there in space that are actually still producing light, the most distant galaxies, for instance. By comparing the object with the maximum luminosity possible in the universe, and that is a high mass star at the end of its life going through something called a supernova. By comparing that peak brightness to the brightness of the object, you can use that peak brightness of a supernova as a standard, and you can then figure out the distance to that object using the amount of apparent brightness that actually still reaches Earth. By, again, comparing it to the peak brightness of how bright anything can actually be. So that's what the distant standards are all about. Hubble's law requires us to understand that the universe is actually expanding an object's redshift, and that also gives us a way of calculating distances to these really, really distant galaxies. The Cepheids are stars that actually vary in the amount of light that they produce. They're the only stars that actually pulse in the night sky. And because they pulse, they allow us a way of figuring out the true luminosity of that object and then comparing other stars that maybe don't do this and don't pulse um, to those objects. And then finally, the main sequence fitting is about having a certain catalog of stars at our disposal and by comparing comparing other things like the spectral type of those stars, we can then back calculate and get to luminosity and get to distance that way. So what you can basically take away from this is that beyond the nearby stars, it gets increasingly more complex to determine the distance to the stars, but that's still completely necessary in order to understand a star's luminosity. Because without at least some, uh, you know, approximation of the distance to those stars, we don't have a way of comparing them apples to apples. Then we're at the mercy of how much light actually just reaches us as opposed to how much light the object produces. So assuming that we've got luminosity underway, assuming that we can figure out luminosity and we can take distance out of it and not be dealing with apparent brightness anymore, we can go on to the next, the second major property of stars that we use as a basis for comparison. This one works out a, in a way that actually makes it a little bit easier to understand than, than luminosity because so much of the temperature of a star uh, can at least be broadly estimated by its color. Dim stars are red and then they uh, progress up to being orange and yellow as they increase in temperature. They also increase in luminosity. Then they go on to being white stars and light blue to a, a darker blue. We can refine that a little bit more. Instead of just talking purely about color, we can think about it in terms of something called spectral type. So all of the stars in the night sky that we've had the pleasure of being able to observe from the, the Earth's surface, and that's not every star that's out there, but that's a lot of stars, we have put into a, one of seven categories. And these seven categories have a letter that abbreviates the type um, that we would put into that category. The letters are O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And these are the seven spectral types of stars. So every star out there, including our own, would fall into one of these seven spectral types. Our star is a G2 spectral type, and it corresponds to surface temperature of 5,830 Kelvin. Now, the way that this happened, the way that we went about um, classifying these stars into these seven spectral types, goes back to the beginning of the 20th century and a mathematician and astrophysicist who was working at Harvard at the time named Edward Pickering. He hired a bunch of women to work in his lab and to go about painstakingly, star by star, putting the stars into this classification system. And the classification system was actually invented by one of these women. Uh, she was deaf. Her name was um, Annie Jump Cannon. 
and other women that worked in this same lab, uh, Levia de Swan, um, Cecilia Payne, they went about not only classifying these stars and doing that basic work that Edward Pickering wanted done, but really inventing the stellar classification system that we still use today. It really came mainly out of the work that was done in this lab. Um, I'm going to show you in just a minute a little brief video, um, a, a clip from the movie, a, a clip from the TV show Cosmos. Um, it was uh, episode nine. It was called Sisters of the Sun, and they go into the story and also the story of lifespans of stars. So that's a really good episode to go back and watch in its entirety, and that just may be the little clip that I show you today. But um, I'll just be showing you in just a minute, just a, a few minutes, just a little clip from that, that video. The idea goes back to how a star's temperature is going to relate to its spectral type because its um, temperature is going to relate to the completeness of its spectrum. If you go back to that first picture again, an O-type star, the brightest and hottest star, is going to produce the most complete spectrum with the fewest absorption lines. And those few absorption lines don't just tell you about the object's temperature. The placement of those lines also tell you about the star's composition. And then as you go from an O to a B, a B to an A type star, and downwards all the way down to a K or an M type star, you have a less complete spectrum with more of those little blacked out lines, those absorption lines, and that might point to uh, variations in composition of the star as well. So what we can take away from this is that the completeness of its spectrum is going to point out uh, not just the composition of the star, but it's also going to relate to its temperature. And so that's what we're really getting at when we classify stars by spectral type, is we're coming up with a way to at least estimate temperature. So this temperature ranges from the O-type stars, those are the hottest stars, and those stars progress upwards to about 50 thousand Kelvin, and that's a surface temperature. A surface temperature star with th that has a temperature of 50,000 Kelvin would be approaching hundreds of million of Kelvin in, in terms of its actual core temperatures. So that's the hottest stars that are possible. Any hotter in the star undergoes fusion at such a rate that it can't be bound by gravity anymore and it blows itself up instead. And those stars are increasingly rare now, but the original generation of stars might have had some stars that were just too hot to exist and fusion happened at too great a rate. Then as you trend down from O to B and B to A and so on, all the way to K and M type stars, the lower limit is a surface temperature of about 3000 Kelvin for your very, very coolest M type stars. And any cooler than that, you don't have the core temperatures necessary to start fusion in the first place. And then gravity continues to crush the object inward until it exerts enough outwards force just by the pressure of atoms being squished against each other that it can't be crushed any further. It turns into an astrophysical object called a brown dwarf in that case. And so that gives you the full range here from the very, very hottest O-type star all the way down to the very coolest M-type star. So you can already see one kind of weird thing about this stellar classification system, the spectral type classification, is that it actually progresses from hot to cold instead of from cold to hot like you would sort of expect it to. So as promised, I wanted to show you a little clip of the women that actually made this possible and invented this um, stellar classification system, this classification system based on spectral type. And they also go in and explain it in a little bit more detail. So I hope you enjoy this. In 1901, Harvard was a man's world. But an astronomer named Edward Charles Pickering broke that rule. Old Pickering's office is just down the hallway. And that door over there leads to the room where he keeps his computers. We're supposed to call those women computers, but uh, I've heard more than one fellow refer to those gals as 
Pickering's harem. <laughs> Pickering assembled a team of women to map and classify the types of stars. One of them provided the key to our understanding of the substance of the stars, and another devised a way for us to calculate the size of the universe. For some reason, you probably never heard of either of them. Wonder why? That's Annie Jump Cannon, the leader of the team. Before she was through, she cataloged a quarter of a million stars. Number 11 is the B7. That's Alcyone in the Pleiades. Cannon lost her hearing during a bout of scarlet fever when she was a young woman. Number 12 is the B6. That's Henrietta Swan Levitt. She's also deaf, and she's the other great scientist in the room. Levitt discovered the law that astronomers still use more than a century later to measure the distances to the stars and the size of the cosmos itself. Annie Jump Cannon sent out a Christmas card explaining what she and her sisters were actually doing. The light from a star is allowed to fall through a prism placed in the telescope, she wrote. Thus magnified, the starlight is split up into a band, showing its component colors the red rays going to one end, and the violet to the other. This is the spectrum of the star. It shows the presence of fine dark lines. By comparing them with lines given by glowing substances in the laboratory, we can determine that the same elements familiar to us on the Earth also exist in the outermost star. Number 12358B. Number one at this point is the B type star. Make that a B2. It took Canon decades to classify the spectral character of hundreds of thousands of stars according to the scheme that she devised. Cannon discovered that the stars fell into a continuous sequence of seven broad categories, according to their spectral line patterns. Each was designated by a letter. But the spectral lines of two stars in the same letter class could differ in subtle ways, minute variations that Cannon learned to recognize from memory. To distinguish these spectra from one another, she assigned 10 numerical subcategories for each class. Annie Jump Cannon organized the stars, but it would fall to another scientist to decipher the hidden meaning in her work. All right, so that's the basis of our classification system. That's the origin of our spectral um, type classification system. And it really went back to those, those women, those very important women over at Harvard, uh, and very underappreciated women. So having the spectral type be laid out this way, just by a series of letters that don't go in alphabetical order, it does, I'll admit, make it really difficult to remember the sequence. And so like any case where you're dealing with uh, some random string of letters and trying to remember those letters, a mnemonic device makes this a lot easier. And some mnemonic devices are easier to remember than others. Um, the uh, most obscure one that I've heard is um, for the... Uh, uh, spectral type for a mnemonic device to try to remember those is only bungling astronomers forget generally known mnemonics. Uh, I can't even believe I remember that. That's so hard to remember. So that's probably not the best one to go back to. Uh, the one that I always try to remind everybody of that's a lot easier to try to remember is O-B-A-F-G-K-M, oh, be a fine girl or guy, it works either way, kiss me. So that's a really easy way to try to remember the sequence in which those letters progress. And the sequence is really important because, again, it ties back to temperature. The other thing that's really important here is that each letter is not by itself a complete spectral type because you have sort of shades of gray within each one of those letters. A star like our sun that might be a little closer to a G-type star than to an F-type star. Its absorption lines might cl more closely match a G-type star, might be put into this category of not just being a G-type star, but a G2 
So it's a 10 point decimal place system that gets you two tenths of the way from a G to an F type star. You can also have a B5, a K3, and so on. And that gives you the complete spectral type of that star. And that corresponds to a surface temperature. So it's really important to remember that that surface temperature is only an estimate based on the spectral type. We're more certain about the spectral type. So when we go about graphing all of this data later, it's really important to remember that we graph it based on the spectral type and not temperature because the temperature is a less sure quantity. So again, that surface temperature range in, in stars, and that's surface temperature, not core temperatures, because the core temperatures are well, well, well greater than a, a million Kelvin. That surface temperature range is from about 3,000 to from your very, very coolest red star out there to a surface temperature of hypothetically up to 50,000 Kelvin. So that takes you through the full spectrum of temperature in the stars pictured here in the Hubble Deep Field. You have your reds, your oranges, your yellow stars like our sun with a surface temperature of maybe five or 6,000 Kelvin, on up to all of the white stars that are out there that might be approaching 10, 15,000 Kelvin for their surface temperature, to the light blue and to the even darker blue stars. And what's really cool about this picture is that a lot of these blue stars in the picture are extremely luminous as well as being high in temperature. And their starlight reaches across galaxies and even from one galaxy to another. These stars might be so distant and the light from those stars might say it takes such an incredible amount of time to reach Earth that they may not even be there anymore their light just still continues to shine because of that time lapse and how much time it takes for the star's light to actually reach us. Maybe the death throes of that star's are is still to reach us tomorrow or two months from now. We, we, we don't know, not until we actually see the death of that high mass star. Now, Again, uh, and I just sort of briefly alluded to this when I talked about some of those blue stars being high mass stars. The properties of luminosity and temperature, while they're really um, the, the, the most straightforward to try to measure directly, don't tell you everything about a star because the temperature and the luminosity are really just aspects of the star's mass. The mass is absolutely the most important property of a star because it determines everything about it. How long it can maintain hydrogen fusion for, from a few million years to 10 billion years. It, so in terms, it basically determines the star's lifespan, the mass of the star. It determines its luminosity, its temperature, its spectral type, everything about a star, when you peel back all the layers, it's really going to come back to mass. So in this way, if we had some way of going about from each star one to the next and putting it on a scale and directly measuring the mass of the star, we'd be home free. We'd have a way of directly measuring the most important property of that star, but we can't do that. In fact, mass ends up being the, um, the most difficult property of a star to observe directly and to measure directly. So oftentimes we're forced to sort of back calculate and determine the mass from luminosity or from temperature, especially with stars that are in a certain part of their overall lifespan. We call them main sequence stars that are undergoing hydrogen fusion. So even though it's very difficult to determine directly, there are some cases that actually make this fairly easy. Take, for instance, uh, the mass of our sun is something that's fairly easy to measure directly. And this is something that Kepler gave us the tools to be able to do because he gave us a way of looking at the orbital properties of two objects, one in orbit around the other. And Newton then gave us a way of determining mass from those orbital properties. So we can use Newton's version of Kepler's third law in order to determine mass directly of either object that you want to talk about, either the lower mass object that's orbiting around the, the um, heavier object or the heavier object that is the more of the focal point.
So by doing this, what Newton was really doing was he was looking at the relationship between these two orbital properties, the distance between the two objects, and the time it takes for one object to move around the other, the orbital period. He was looking at A and P in terms of Kepler's third law. Newton was basically taking those orbital properties for the Earth-Sun system and for the system in our solar system and comparing it to things going on outside of our own solar system. And he was using math to be able to figure out the mass of either object. It's pretty ingenious, actually. So as it turns out, you can rewrite A cubed equals P squared, Kepler's third law, into m1 plus m2, that's the mass of the two objects, equals a cubed, which is the average distance again, measured in astronomical units, divided by p squared, the orbital period in terms of years. So Newton's version of Kepler's third law essentially allows us a way to determine mass, but only if you have two objects, one in orbit around the other, or both in orbit around a common center of mass, which is more common for the kind of cases that we're going to have. So one example is you could determine easily the mass of our sun because you have lots of objects to pick um, that you have both an orbital period and an average distance for. You can pick any planet in our solar system. For other stars beyond our solar system, this is increasingly more difficult to do because actually d detecting planets and other solar systems is something that we've just begun to be able to do. And it's not something that we can do and determine the distance between the star and that planet with any kind of uh, real efficiency. So the one case where this is fairly easy to do, where you can measure mass directly, is in a certain type of star system called a binary star system. And this is completely unlike our own solar system. In our own solar system, we have one star. It's called the sun. In a binary star system, a certain quirk of how that nebula collapsed in on itself to form the star allows for the formation of more than one star, potentially two, making it a binary system. So the binary star system that's pictured here is one with two sun-like stars. And that's not usually how these things actually progress. Typically you have one really big, fancy, bright, high temperature, high mass star, and you have a fairly small little companion star. Almost like a case where you have twins born, but you have something more like a Siamese twin kind of relationship. You have your one sort of healthy twin and then this one that's dependent on the other. So whether you have two equal twins, like the system that's pictured here, or a system where you have a big twin and a little twin, you have a case where these two objects, these two stars, are in orbit around a common center of mass. And that common center of mass is a little bit skewed towards the biggest and more massive of the two. If you can determine the distance between those stars and the time it takes for a complete orbit to be had, then you can use Newton's version of Kepler's third law and directly measure the mass of either star in the system. It's pretty ingenious. It's pretty cool. Not only that, but there's a certain quirk that happens with these binary star systems that I wanted to at least very briefly show you. It comes from that same episode of Cosmos that we were talking about earlier, and then I let you watch earlier. But this time, I'm going to take you through like less than a minute of this. Basically, this is going to show you what happens when one star in a system dies and the other star is still going. The star that's still going can bring the dead twin back to life. Uh, basically, what we're dealing with here are zombie stars or a case where you have something called a nova. So I'll let Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, take you through that. <laughs> The stars in a binary star system can have different fate. Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, has a very faint stellar companion, a white dwarf. It was once a sun-like star. Someday, when Sirius runs out of fuel and becomes a red giant, it will shed its substance onto the white dwarf. The intense gravity of the companion will attract that gas, pulling it into a spiraling disk. When the gas from the larger star falls onto the surface of the white dwarf, it will trigger nuclear explosions. 
the greatest burst will release 100,000 times more energy than the sun. Each one of those starbursts is called a nova, from the Latin for new. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that. It's basically just a cool little bit of color there. Um, some weird cases that you get with these binary star systems. The main thing that I want to impress upon you is that in binary star systems, you can directly measure mass. But whether that mass is directly measured in something like a binary star system, or it's measured uh, through first understanding luminosity or temperature, we can get at least a fair range of the masses of all the stars out there that we've been able to catalog. And what it basically boils down to is that there are stars that are um, hundreds of the mass of our star. So they are far, far less massive, making them dimmer and cooler than our star. And there are also stars that are hundreds of times the mass of our star, up to a hundred times the mass of our star. And that property, that range in mass is what is influencing all of the other properties. The range in luminosity and the range in temperature and spectral type are an aspect of that range in mass. Not only that, but what we'll see next time is that that range in mass also allows for huge differences in the way that fusion takes place and the overall lifespan of these stars as a result. The, what I want to close on today is this idea that you can take these central properties of stars, especially the ones that are the easiest to determine directly, and you can graph them against each other. That's what two scientists in the early part of the 20th century, Hertzsprung and Russell, did. And they called their diagram the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or the HR diagram for short. And this is the way that most... Um, a, a, astrophysicists and astronomers go about classifying stars today is that they look at both the luminosity and the spectral type and or temperature of the stars, graph those two properties against each other and see if they find any patterns. And they absolutely did find amazing patterns that stem up. And it has implications for the point in which a star finds itself in its overall lifespan, the size of the star, the mass of the star, all of all of these things actually show up on the HR diagram, even though all you're doing is really graphing luminosity and spectral type. So I want to first start you off with sort of the basic, basic structure of the HR diagram. The y-axis, or the vertical axis, is luminosity in terms of comparing that luminosity to our sun's luminosity. This is called intrinsic luminosity. So on this chart, our star would have a luminosity of 1, a star that is 100 times truly bright as our star, a hundred times as luminous as our star, would be graphed at a hundred. A star that's a tenth as luminous as our star would be crafted a tenth and so on. So that's the y-axis. The x-axis is a little bit harder to understand because, again, the thing that we know a little bit better than temperature is actually spectral type. And there are those seven spectral types that come back to us again. OBAF, GKM. Obi a fine guy, kiss me, so on. Okay, so those are the seven spectral types, and there are grades in between each one of those, a 10-point scale. The spectral type is a proxy for temperature, but it actually ranges from the O-type stars being the hottest to the M-type stars being the coolest. So one weird quirk of this graph is that temperature actually increases from right to left on this graph instead of from left to right. It makes it very different than most cases where you're graphing two properties against each other. Most of the time, both things are going to um, increase away from the origin. So I just wanted to point that out to you. So temperatures on this graph range from, on the far left, 50,000 Kelvin to the far right, 3,000 Kelvin, instead of the other way around. To give you an idea of where our sun would graph on a chart like this, if we have that uh, horizontal line that just came up on the screen as being a luminosity of 1 and partway between a G and an F being a G2 type star, then that place where the two would meet would be where our sun would plot on this graph. A star that was both brighter and hotter than our star would plot up towards the upper left. A star that was both dimmer and cooler than our sun would plot over by the bottom right. 
And most stars, as it turns out, are going to plot right down the middle of this diagram, not from the bottom left up to the upper right, but from the lower right up to the upper left. Uh, so again, sort of counter to the way that you usually expect two things that are going to be dependent upon each other to progress on a chart like this. So the next thing I want to show you is what a real spectral type actually looks like. I mean, I'm sorry, a real HR diagram. Luminosity again on the Y, spectral type over on the X axis, and by spectral type we can determine temperature. Temperature increasing from right to left instead of left to right. 90% of stars fall right down the middle of this diagram and have a very predictable relationship between their surface temperature and their luminosity. As the surface temperature increases, so too does the luminosity. And that's why most of the stars, including our sun, and including some of the brightest stars in the night sky, all fall down the middle of this diagram. And that middle is called the main sequence. As it turns out, main sequence stars are just not really so much a type of star, but a star undergoing the normal part of its lifespan. If you consider sort of the normal part of your life to be the point where you start walking around on the surface of the earth a, to the point where you're bound to a wheelchair at the end of your life, then that's sort of the normal overall range of, of, of your life. And that's very similar to the main sequence stars converting hydrogen into helium. When they run out of core hydrogen, then they're in a weird part of their life. That's when they swell and expand, and then they fall up on the upper right-hand side of this graph. There be giants. The giant stars that are in the later stages of their lives, and they swell and expand, that's where they're going to fall. Their temperature decreases, but their luminosity increases, so all of a sudden they don't fall on that predictable part of the diagram anymore. After the stars are already dead, they leave behind their exposed cores of whatever the latest uh, material is to actually have formed through fusion. And that's found on the lower left-hand part of the diagram. That's where the dwarves form. These are uh, basically stellar remnants. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I like to kind of take everybody through the HR diagrams. It's just another version of the HR diagram with the spectral type laid out on the x-axis and play a little game where you have to determine where the hottest and where the coolest and where the biggest star falls. So the first question we're going to ask here is which star, a star A, B, C, or D, due to its placement on the HR diagram, would ha be the hottest in terms of surface temperature. Because surface temperature increases from, left, uh, from, um, from right to left, A has to be the hottest star, even though it's not a main sequence star, even though it's a remnant, it's Sirius B, the one that gets jump-started by Sirius A, its twin. So A is the hottest of those stars, it, but only because it falls furthest over to the left. If you have to ask the question, which star is going to be the most luminous, it has to be the one closest to the very top. Again, making it not a main sequence star, but the one that falls closest to the top of the diagram. So the most luminous star is C. It also happens to be the biggest star because radius increases from the bottom left up to the upper right. If I ask the question, which star is a main sequence star, it falls down right through the middle of that diagram where the main sequence star is and falls really close to where our sun would plot on this diagram. It's the star that's labeled D. And then finally, if you had to ask which star has the largest radius, it's another way of saying which one is the biggest. And you can already see the progression based on the names. In the lower left you have dwarves, then you have main sequence or sort of normal stars, and then you have giants and super giants as you progress towards the upper right. So as you go from lower left to upper right, um, you're actually increasing in the size of the star, and that's part of why the temperature decreases, because the star actually expands. So the star on this graph that has the largest size or the largest radius is actually C. So we ignored B. B was not the answer to any of the questions.
All right, so that kind of takes you through HR diagrams, which you will absolutely see again. And the next two lectures that we're going to do are still going to be dealing with stars. We're going to basically take all the stars out there, including our own, and put them into one of two categories, either a low mass star or a high mass star. The first thing that we're going to do is, in the next lecture, progress through the entire lifespan from origin to beginning to end to remnant of low mass stars. And then we'll do the same thing for high mass stars. And what we're going to find out is sometimes the remnants of these stars, what gets left behind after they die in a sense, can be even more fascinating than the star itself. So I hope you enjoy what we have coming up. Uh, until next time, keep looking up.